And the topic today is SwiftUI at scale. So usually, most of the developers have uh, some experience with SwiftUI with basic Apple tutorial, and they usually don't go that far. And when they go, they uh, have some issues, and they don't really implement it. We have about three years have passed since the start uh, of the SwiftUI. And um, let's recap how uh, we can use SwiftUI in, uh, if we can use SwiftUI in the projects right now. So first of all, what is scale? And uh, we are talking about one, more than one billion of devices running this app. They use it to make a very important financial decisions all the time. And all of you here very likely be able to develop it in one day with SwiftUI. Meet the app. Indeed, it's at scale. But we are talking about slightly different kind of scale here. And um, let's define it. So the scale is when multiple developers working on multiple code bases and produce multiple applications, maybe for different uh, versions or different uh, designs, or even different platforms. So that's what we are going to focus on. Not the amount of users, not the, how often the users uh, work with the app, but actually uh, how complex the code base is. And that is the focus of our talk. Meet the FS Protection app. It's a super app. Uh, it has a modular architecture, so uh, each developer can work with it independently of the other ones. For example, if we have the, here uh, save browsing or uh, ID monitoring, these features can be developed independently by different developers, by different teams. And uh, it has shared code with Mac, and it's live on the App Store. Just go and check it out yourself. This is a screenshot I took today uh, from the App Store version of the app. But we are going to focus here only on one feature. Because it's a super app, it's pretty much very complex. And one feature we are going to focus on is the password vault. The password vault has been developed um, only in SwiftUI. So uh, and all the learnings that I'm going to share today are uh, relevant to that project. So let's go into the password vault. The app opens like that. And uh, we have the not the login screen, but the unlock screen. Uh, then when we unlock with face ID or the password, we can see the uh, list. You can go and add a new password or credit card. Uh, pretty much edit all the fields. Uh, new entry has been added. And now we can change the color or an icon of the field. And of course, the autofill works as well. So for example, I'm trying to sign into Google. I click on the passwords. I have the password suggested, and uh, I can fill it in. That also works. And just to recap, all of that, what you've seen so far, built with SwiftUI. So what I've learned when working on this project? Well, I guess, where is the, where is the tip? Don't see it. Oh no, the preview has crashed. Well, yeah, the first thing you do when you work with SwiftUI is you try to figure out how to make the preview work. And usually that's where uh, you hit a wall when you start working with the standard Apple tutorial. At some point, your preview just doesn't work and doesn't help you anymore. And usually people just uh, give up and use SwiftUI without the previews, or they just go back directly to UIKit. So let's figure out how we can fix the preview first. Let's start with the healthy previews. So usually when the preview is not working correctly and you're having crashes, it's one of those. Either the project is too big, the build takes too long, or the runtime error due to some side effects. For example, a database of the preview is somehow not in the same state as the database of the real app that you're running on device. So let's get rid of those side effects. First of all, let's take a look how usually the iOS app is structured. Normally, app has one target, and the code can be roughly split into two pieces. There is like a UI code, which is uh, uh, either UIKit or SwiftUI or AppKit if it is a uh, Mac app. And there is something related to model logic, model code, and something gluing it together. That's usually how we've been developed apps for so, 
for so long. And uh, if we try to optimize this app for Swift UI, we need to think a little bit differently. So we still have to put the UI code somewhere. And uh, we still need to put the model somewhere. But remember, it's the model that's causing us all of those problems because it's too heavy, it's too slow to compile, or it might have some additional side effects. So I see the question, right? Yeah, is it, is it a problem with only the Intel-based machines or also the M1 plate? It does matter. Uh, so I'm ha having here an Apple Silicon, and this problem is reproduced pretty much with every machine. Okay. You just hit this wall earlier on the um, Intel or on the older machine. Uh, or if it's related to the side effect, well, you will hit the wall anyway because uh, there's some problem in the, in the code that you can't really, like, you, you don't get the exception, you don't see it, you just see the preview crashed. Mm -hmm. But you have to go to diagnostics and look into what actually happened there and what specific problem is there. Uh, so anyway, let's focus on getting rid of this problem. And yeah, so we need to put the model somewhere. And uh, yeah. To solve this issue, to not to put the heavy model into the our uh, Swift UI optimized target, we just create a mock model, which is essentially a um, a pluggable model that doesn't have any databases or states, and it just has a very simple interface, the same as the original model. Uh, if it's let's say a social networking feed, that will be uh, a model that will uh, can be requested for uh, new posts, let's say, or tweets. If it's uh, some other application then you have a corresponding model, like for example, a pricing table or something related to the app, or that could be completely the whole feature uh, that is uh, being developed in this package. So you create a mock model, which is essentially the same or shadow of the real model, and you plug it in. And then you have two options. So you have either one uh, to compile with the preview model or with the real model, depending on which target you would like to get. That's the first step to, uh, to enable productive development with uh, previews. Remember that the pre with previews you don't really care about the uh, re realistic data. What you really need to see something that you can display your UI against. So the, this fake or mock model is totally okay for this task. And let's take a look at the code. So we start with SwiftUI and uh, we create two protocols, one protocol and two classes which essentially just in, uh, implement those protocols so that we can swap the model whenever we want. And now, uh, just take note that this mock model is very lightweight, so just a single Swift class. And let's take a look at the code. Uh, in the view, you have this model, and you use this model, of course, here to define some properties, for example, the opacity of the circle or um, something else. But the gist of it that you can swap this model whenever you please. So you can change it to a real one or to the mock one. In the preview, the correspondingly you use the uh, model mock and you initialize your view with that model and you never change this afterwards. Uh, yeah, so uh, to take this to the next level, we need to use Swift Package Manager. This really doesn't work well with other package managers such as Cocket Pods because they are a bit too clunky and you need to edit the files, the pod files, deploy it to specs and you lose the agility. So I highly recommend using Swift Package Manager. Let's take a look how we structure this into the packages. So let's say we have a two packages, right? We have the package one which contains the UI and the mock and then the package two which contains all the heavy stuff. It's separated and uh, you can even work on the UI without even touching the uh, second package. Uh, by the way, of course, if you want, you can use you can move all of those targets here. The um, the whole idea of a uh, fast building target will still be there. You just will clone the this uh, these files as well and resolve all of those packages as well. So it really doesn't matter. You can still keep them into uh, one package. There is no requirement. But what we see here is that we can actually expand this further, and we can create a special target for Mac and put that in a separate package. So now we have the separate UI for Mac, which is building against the, the uh, model mock, and we have a UI for the iOS, which is building also against the mock. And when you want to build an app, or would you like to test something 
uh, some real functionality of the app, you can actually build against a real model. And since we're talking scale here, those packages can be developed by different teams. So when I'm working on the iOS project, I don't even touch the Mac. Or when I'm working on the Mac, I don't even touch the iOS. And of course, uh, and of course uh, we don't have any conflicts, we don't have any merging issues because we separated work on those packages. Now let's go further with localizations. Normally the Swift UI is really easy to localize. So uh, you just create the localized text and that's it. But here's one problem. So uh, usually this, the app assumes that you are going to fetch the localizations from the main bundle, so your application target. And that of course doesn't work when you have your UI stored in a separate package. So what you do, you specify that bundle in all of the NS localized strings or labels and so forth. Just don't forget to put bundle module there. Let's take a look how we can share the UI between the teams. So you remember this slide where we had a separate uh, UI for each platform. But it's clearly something missing here that we don't see. If we zoom in, we see that both of the teams have something related to the UI. And pretty much if we develop products for different uh, platforms, there is some similarity. Buttons might be the same, the colors might be the same. Yes, there's a uh, Usually you have the shared UI and uh, both teams work on each module, each uh, component of the UI. But now we can create a shared UI library that's actually going to contain both parts, some components that you can use both in the UI, in the iOS and in the Mac world. So usually when we talk about the code sharing, it's usually something like that. With Swift UI, you build one app and you write on all the platforms. But uh, the truth is that you always want to have some differences on the Mac and the iOS. So that's a better solution because you can, or I would say more realistic solution, that you can have some code shared and some code specified, specific for the platform. And again, this is incorporated in a separate package. And of course, since we went with uh, already shared UI, we just shared the design system. And the design system update is simply to update a package, as simple as update some package. The design system contains such things such as uh, uh, colors, font configurations, and um, the font configurations, and even uh, in case of the shared UI, we have even localized components there. So the component contains both the uh, localization as well as the UI and pretty much everything that you can use. It's like a ready-made button. And now let's talk about the memory management. So uh, normally with the classic UI kit, it's very simple. You have the view control that holds pretty much everything the model code, or if you use um, MVC, or if you use a wiper or another architecture, usually everything is tied to the view controller. Uh, it's like a centerpiece, and you usually don't want to mess around and create parallel hierarchies of memory. So uh, if you create a next view controller, uh, which has been presented, and the other one being dismissed, as soon as the view controller is deallocated, the model is as well deallocated. Or if you have a shared model, that model stays in memory, uh, until all of the view controllers that have the reference to it are deallocated. Very simple. But with Swift UI, it's a bit more complex. And let's give a bit of examples. So uh, the view model looks like that, just title and subtitle. And uh, just note that it's observed object and it has a couple of published properties. But when we uh, started to talk about the view controller, View controller is a class, and it means that it is a reference counted object. It always uh, has some identity. That's the core, uh, what being a class is. And Swift UI view is just a struct. So it can be regenerated multiple times per the cycle of the screen, and that's OK. Uh, what that is, uh, what's a bit uh, concerning is that um, once the, the view is regenerated, all the references that it held are released. And Swift UI has a special construct to overcome this challenge and mainly to use the uh, property wrappers such as state object and state or observed object. Uh, so what's the difference? The 
state object and state view creates and owns it. And across the view redraw cycle, if the view is regenerated, uh, the state is uh, kept across that regeneration. S uh, same both for state object and for state. The only difference is that the state object is actually used for the object, like a class or an, an actor or um, pretty much any uh, object that has an identity. And state used for structs or other less uh, or other values without um, identity or value types. And observed object, it doesn't hold any reference. It just observes means that you can subscribe to some of those properties and listen to them and update your view hierarchy. So let's take a look. Uh, yeah, when you have a shared model, it's very simple. You just declare it as observed object and uh, uh, essentially when you have a one model per all of the screens, one view model, uh, then you just use the view model and there's nothing special. You declare it as observed object and the view hierarchy or memory hierarchy looks like that. So there is someone who owns the model, let's say app delegate, or that could be pretty much any other uh, class. And uh, then in turn, the view model is passed as the observed object. There is no need to hold it. That's simple. Similar to the way in UIKit. But if we go to this design where we have each view model responsible only for its screen, that's where it becomes challenging. Who owns the view model? Of course, we would like to make it the same as in UIKit so that each screen owns corresponding view model. And as soon as the uh, screen is off and not needed, deallocated, the model is also deallocated. So ideally, we should declare it as state object. And the problem is that the state object has to be created inside the view. You can't just assign it. So uh, one of the solutions, you can go this way. You have the state object, and then you try to create it with the view model that you have passed. But I do not recommend doing that because the view model will be created multiple times uh, when the view is being redrawn. So uh, note how we, how we are passing the same uh, instance. But uh, if you create the instance in the initializer somewhere of this view, if you create a view model from scratch, it will be created each time. So there should be someone who still owns the view model. This will not uh, give us the desired effect of holding the reference to the view model across the view redraws. And um, this is the solution that we uh, found out, is to use this construct. The auto closure escaping and the closure is passed, which creates a view model. And then uh, you just, once you create a view model, you, uh, you just um, uh, execute this closure and store it across the view redraws. Let's take a look a bit more in detail. So uh, this is how you use it at call site. Because of the auto closure, we don't really care about the closure. We can pass the view model as the instance. It will be captured. The closure will be created for you. And uh, yeah, so there are three steps. Capturing the closure. That's why it's escaping, because uh, it's being stored for some time after the function returns. Then you execute the closure. Uh, to generate the first instance of view model, and you just assign it to a state object in order to manage its um, to manage its um, life cycle across uh, the life cycle of the screen to tie them together. Uh, let's go with the Q and A, um, and just one note that you can download and test this app yourself. Uh, it's all written in Swift UI, the password management component, and you can try it right now. Just look for the FS protection on the App Store.